arrived here in August 1923 with uh, $40 in my pocket and uh, a coat and a pair of trousers that didn't match. In just a few decades, Walt Disney will become one of the most beloved storytellers in history. But while his legacy remains his stories and characters, he should be remembered as an innovator constantly pushing the boundaries of animation. After arriving in Los Angeles in the early days of animation, he started by animating silent shorts that fit in with the style and conventions of the time. In those days, animation was only used in shorts that were shown before a feature to warm up an audience. He found success with a character named Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. The Oswald shorts, like everything else produced at the time, were accompanied by only generic musical score. He rode Oswald's success until 1928, when producer Charles Mintz used a contract loophole to take the character's rights from Walt. Mintz continued producing Oswald shorts without Disney, but Walt was in need of a new success, and he hoped it would come with the creation of a new character, Mickey Mouse. On May 15, 1928, Disney debuted the very first short starring Mickey Mouse, playing crazy in a test screening. The silent film failed to pick up a distributor, forcing Walt back to the drawing board. The first Mickey Mouse was made silent, and while we were making the first Mickey Mouse, sound came. So we uh, decided that uh, there was no sense in making anything more silent, and we immediately switched to sound. It, uh, I think, played the, the big part in establishing Mickey Mouse. On November 18, 1928, Walt released Steamboat Willie, the short that introduced Mickey Mouse to the public, to much acclaim. But Mickey wasn't the most important thing to come from that short. It was sound synchronized to the actions on the screen, a first for animation. For the first time, audiences could hear cartoon characters speak, laugh, whistle, and play music. This was all accompanied by sound effects such as a boat on the water, the spin of a wheel, and the sound of a horn to immerse audiences in a way impossible before. The New York Times called it an ingenious piece of work. Audiences loved it so much, they began asking projectionists to delay the start of features to rerun Steamboat Willie. Steamboat Willie was such a success that Plane Crazy was remade with sound and released the following year. The innovation of adding sound to animation led to a new series of musical shorts called The Silly Symphonies. Sound was now a mainstay in animation, but Walt went a step further. In 1932, he released Flowers and Trees, the very first film of any kind to be made in Technicolor, which allowed for an expanded array of color due to its three-strip process, one more than all other color films before then had used. Flowers and Trees was originally being produced in black and white, but Walt was so enamored by Technicolor that he made his artist completely start over. This expensive decision proved to be worth it, as Flowers and Trees went on to become the first animated film to win an Academy Award. With Flowers and Trees, the struggling Silly Symphony series was revitalized, and from then on, every Silly Symphony was made in Technicolor. But Walt wasn't satisfied. This is the plan for a super cartoon camera. We call it the Multiplane Camera. In the mid-1930s, Walt and his artists invented a new camera that added a third dimension to animation. Paintings could now be divided into layers that could move independently, simulating movement through an environment. Besides being merely unrealistic, the old-fashioned flat background can also create a false effect. For instance, when our camera moves in closer on this moonlight scene, you'll notice that everything grows larger, including the moon. And here now is our same moonlight scene the way the multiplane camera sees it. As you can see, we finally got the moon to keep its proper distance. The multiplane camera allowed for heightened realism that was never before possible in animation. It was a major step toward feature-length animation, as it allowed Disney to hold audiences' attention for longer through more diverse options for shots. It made its debut in 1937 on the silly symphony, The Old Mill, which won an Academy Award. Instead of panning across or zooming in on a stagnant background, viewers could move through it. Each time it was used, it got better as Disney and his artists learned more about movement. The New York Times specifically admired the impressive camera movements made possible by the multiplane camera in the review of 1940's Pinocchio. The multiplane camera was such a landmark invention, it earned Walt Disney a spot in the National Inventors Hall of Fame. The multiplane camera would be the standard way of animating films for the next 50 years. Sound, multiplane, and technicolor were all leading up to the biggest innovation of all, the move into feature films. In 1934, Disney began production on Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. In doing so, he was breaking new ground, and almost everyone but him thought it was doomed for failure. The media dubbed Snow White, Disney's Folly, a sentiment even Walt's own wife agreed with. It was a big gamble, and other animation studios at the time would not have even considered making a feature-length film. I didn't know what I had or what would happen or anything. We had the, the family fortune. We had everything wrapped up in Snow White. In fact, the 
the banker, I think, was losing more sleep than I was. While Ethan's shorts were arduous and hard work to animate and complete, Snow White was about ten times as long and much more artistically challenging, commanding realism and detail unheard of in animation, with Walt sending his artists to take classes in human anatomy and movement in preparation for the film. In a feature picture, uh, we probably do a couple of million drawings. About a half a million would end up on the screen. Right. The rest of them you throw away because they aren't good enough. On December 21st, 1937, a seven-reel cartoon premiered at the Carthay Circle Theater in Los Angeles. Despite the ridicule leading up to its release, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs opened to rave reviews. It became the highest grossing film ever at the time, even though it was released in the midst of the Great Depression. And fortunately, they though, when we put it in, premiered it and everything else, why everything was, was fine, the banker was happy. Snow White was a success, both critically and financially. It was such a massive achievement, Walt was presented with an honorary Academy Award for pioneering, quote, a great new entertainment field, unquote. He received a full-size Oscar alongside seven miniature ones. Isn't it great, Mr. Disney? Aren't you proud of it, Mr. Disney? Well, I'm so proud, I think I'll bust. <laughs> On Snow White, and through all that whole picture, he was everything had to be better than something that had been done before. This mantra continued through Walt's entire career and caused him to push boundaries that some didn't even know existed. He developed technology as he needed it to make sure each project was better than the last. He made bold decisions to move into uncharted territory and proved critics wrong with unbelievable success. All of Walt Disney's beloved stories were built on the foundation of cutting-edge technology, and his legacy should be his innovation. <laughs>